<coughs> uh, thank you, yes. So I'd like to talk about actually big data and artificial intelligence. But before I do, I'd like to give you a scenario. So uh, uh, Jane uh, lives in, in London, and a new uh, sports shop has just opened on her high street. And uh, being an avid sports fan, Jane goes down and uh, wants to have a look around the shop. She goes through the doors and browses around, doesn't really see anything she likes, and leaves. Now, uh, little to, uh, to J Jane, uh, Jane's realization, when she walked through the door, she didn't really pay much attention to the uh, terms and conditions that were written uh, on the door as she walked through. Uh, terms, on, terms and conditions that stated that uh, the, the shop has the right to follow her around to uh, 24 hours a day to, to take notes about what she likes, what she doesn't like. And to, the reason why they want this information, this data, is that so they can predict uh, the types of uh, products and, uh, and stuff that she'd like to buy. So John is uh, assigned to Jane's case, and John follows her around uh, 24 hours a day making notes. He realizes that she's 40 years old. She has two kids. Uh, she has uh, Persian genes. She likes sport, of course. Uh, she uh, uh, trains for triathlons at the weekend. She eats power bars, you know, the protein bars. She drinks glucose drinks. Uh, she has a high-stress job. And, uh, and actually, uh, uh, John has followed quite a lot of women around in his life, only for his work, of course, not, not for... <laughs> and uh, and uh, he, he made a, a startling realization that uh, about 40 of the women that, Jane has, uh, that uh, John has followed around that have very, very similar profiles to Jane turned out they had uh, a high proportion of them had very aggressive ovarian cancer. Okay, so a large uh, proportion of these women uh, that have very, very similar uh, characteristics as, as Jane have this, uh, this rare, high, aggressive form of ovarian cancer. Now, I want to ask you a question. Should we, uh, should we let Jane know this information? I want you to think about the consequences of not letting her uh, know. Think about the consequences of of, uh, of her dying at a, a younger age, uh, the cost on her children, the cost of society. But well, what if we do tell, let Jane know, let, let her know that she has a, a high chance of, uh, of ovarian cancer, and, and she doesn't, and that causes stress. So just a quick show of hands, who thinks we should tell Jane uh, that she uh, has a high chance? Okay, it's hard to see, I've got a big light in my face. Uh, and uh, who thinks we shouldn't tell Jane? Okay, and who doesn't know? <laughs> Kind of exactly, right? Uh, we, uh, we have these, uh, these questions, uh, these ethical, legal, uh, and moral questions that we're currently trying to deal with right now, and I don't think anybody really knows the, uh, the answer. So what I'm going to try to do is present you with a framework, uh, a framework to understand data-driven decision-making, uh, and then uh, hopefully use that framework to, uh, to raise some of these uh, important uh, moral and, and ethical questions. So the framework has uh, five components. And I want you to really try and remember these. The five components are data, information, knowledge, understanding, and wisdom. Okay? What, what is data? We, we've seen lots of words, uh, lo lots of references to data. What is data? In, in Latin, da data means given things, which I interpret as stuff. Uh, data is letters, numbers, uh, pictures. Uh, it's, uh, it's all of the stuff uh, on the internet. It's, uh, it's all the stuff that's connected via our computers. And uh, uh, 210280 is data. It's not, it could, that could be a date of birth. It could, be a, uh, it could be a sort code. It could be how much money I, I have in my account. It's not until you actually contextualize data does it become useful. And just so you know, big data just means lots of symbols. It means more symbols than you can process on a single machine. So if you think about all of the stuff that's in Twitter, all of the movies that have ever been created, all of the digital movies, it's more than you can process and store on a single machine. So all big data is, is all of this stuff distributed across the internet in companies, in your emails, and, and all things like that. So information is data in context. As I said, it's, uh, it's, uh, when you con contextualize data, then it becomes useful. So that number that I gave you, 210280, is a date of birth. And there's a huge movement at the moment going on behind the scenes in the internet called linked data, where what we're doing is we're empowering machines uh, to, to give meaning to data. We're actually giving, giving uh, pieces of data uh, meaning and, and linking it all together. And I'd encourage you all to go away and look up linked data because it's really going to change the world. And once we start to link data together and give it meaning, then we can start to ask some very interesting questions. I mean, we can organize it. We can query it. And I would argue that the definition of knowledge is 
the uh, organization of, uh, of, of information. Once we've organized some information, once we've identified some patterns, some trends, uh, we can start to know things. So we might know that when the weather's warm, that there's a, there's a high chance of, uh, of, of ice cream sales, right? So uh, there's actually a huge amount of work that's being done in computer science uh, to, to identify patterns and, and, and predictions in, in data, find, using visualization, using machine learning, uh, to, to process all of this information to try and find these patterns. But knowing uh, something doesn't mean that we understand it, and that's the fourth part of this framework. So um, we know that when the weather's warm, that there's more ice cream cells. And that we can use our intelligence to understand why that's the case. Because when it's warm weather, humans are warmer. We like to be cooled down, so we eat cool, uh, cold things. And actually, computers find it very, very difficult to understand, to interpret knowledge. It's a, there's a huge amount of research out there trying to figure out how we can, we can do that. But just knowing, just understanding that when the weather's warm, there's more ice cream that's being sold, doesn't mean uh, anything. What we need to do now is we need to make some decisions based on that. Maybe if you're an ice cream company, you can go and, uh, and, and, and predict that there's going to be warm weather next week and, and therefore try and sell more ice cream. And uh, so that final part of the, 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 the framework is wisdom. It's the utilization of understanding. It's using our understanding to make better decisions. And these, are, these five components are starting to be brought together now in academia. And we're building systems that aggregate data, that, that mine and, and look at big data, that find patterns in it, and try to make decisions based on some of those patterns. And, uh, and I would argue that that's on the verge of artificial intelligence. That's what we do. Right? We, we look at all of the data, we gather it all together, and we uh, build models, and we, we uh, execute on those models, and we make decisions. And once you start to bring all of these different components together in a computer, then I would argue that that's true uh, artificial intelligence. In fact, the best definition of intelligence that I've ever found is goal-directed adaptive behavior. The idea is you've got a goal, and you can behave or act in the world uh, to try and achieve that goal. And perhaps the most important word in that definition is adaptive. That's what we do really well. Uh, computers don't do it so well, but in the, in the next decade, perhaps, we're going to get computers that can automatically learn, automatically uh, adapt. Okay, so now you have the framework. Let's start to uh, understand some, uh, ask some questions of it. So um, the first set of questions are, I think, around data. We've heard from uh, previous speakers that the more data that we have, perhaps the better decisions that we can make from it. So let me ask you a question. What if, what if all data was open? What if your bank records were open, your, uh, your medical records, everything that you did was completely open, there was complete transparency? It reminds me of a story from, from Plato. There's a, there's a story from uh, one of his books called The Republic, and it's The, the Ring of Gyges. And uh, the, the Gyges is, a, uh, is a, a shepherd, and he finds this ring, he puts on the ring and realizes he has the power of, uh, of invisibility, anonymity. What do you do when you have that power of anonymity? What does Gyges do? He, uh, uh, he rapes, a queen, rapes a queen, kills a king, and takes control of this, the, the kingdom. And, uh, and so we're, we're starting to see some of this, uh, this uh, behavior uh, on the internet. So people that are anonymous are, are trolling people and, and, and doing really heinous things. So let's say I made my account details to you, uh, and actually I gave you the ability to take money out of my account. That would probably happen very quickly. <laughs> uh, they could have my student debt as well if they want it. But imagine they want to uh, take some money out of my account. But let's say that, that anybody that touches me, all of that data is also made available. So if you take some money out of my account, then that data is made publicly available to the rest of the, the people. So do you think that you would take data out of my account, uh, sorry, take uh, money out of my account if you knew that that was going to be public? I think in a, in a world where there's more data, more transparency, more public uh, knowledge of, of data, then perhaps we would behave better towards ourselves. I don't know the answers. Um, maybe uh, there's some research over the past decade about being able to look at people's brain, uh, brain, electrical brain activity, and try to understand what they're thinking. So whether they're thinking about an apple or a house. Imagine if some clever dude comes along and, and, and is able to do this at a distance. So he creates a device that's able to look at people's brain waves and, and identifies patterns to understand what they're thinking. Or that you gather together all of, the, all of the, uh, the, the, the gadgets that you're wearing, and you can start making some predictions about, again, what people are thinking. Should that data be made available? I don't know. I, I heard a story recently um, about uh, terms and conditions where uh, some, 
some people in Canary Wharf were, were providing some free Wi-Fi to people. Uh, but to get access to this free Wi-Fi, you needed to sign up to their terms and conditions. In their terms and conditions, it said that we, uh, we now have the right to your firstborn. So I think there are about 250 people that have now signed their rights to their firstborn to this organization to get free Wi-Fi. So uh, I would encourage you to, <laughs> to, uh, to, to make sure you read the terms and conditions. And, and actually, this raises a good point, and it's been raised by some of the other speakers, which is uh, perhaps some of the things that are inside these uh, terms and conditions should be made more transparent to you guys. What, what can the companies do with the data they're collecting? Who are they selling it to? In the, in the same way that we had, uh, we had uh, complex food labels, I and mean, it's very, very difficult to understand whether these foods that we're consuming are good for us or bad for us, uh, the government has legislated that we have to have these labels on there now to see how much salt and sugar and things like that are in our food. And perhaps we also need the same thing for our, our terms and conditions. So the second set of questions that I want to uh, ask are, are about inferences, about extracting inferences from, from data. Who, who owns these inferences? When, when I sign up my, my, uh, my data away to an organization, I tell them my name and my address and things like that. And, and I actually have the right to know what information that organization has about me. But let's say that organization makes some inferences about me. Uh, it makes some inferences about when I might die or um, whether I'm having an affair or something like that. Should I have the right to that information too? I don't know. Uh, imagine if we, uh, uh, if, if we were able to... to in Jane's case, help people understand their, their health problems before they become uh, a, a detriment to, soci to society. So this question about who owns these inferences, I think, is a very uh, interesting one. Uh, what, it, what happens if we create algorithms that are prejudiced? Who, who's responsible for creating racist algorithms? Uh, right? <laughs> so if you, uh, if you want to go and uh, uh, get some insurance, there, there's some algorithm there deciding whether or not you should have insurance. Uh, but that algorithm is using the color of your skin, your ethnicity, uh, perhaps your sex to determine whether you should have insurance or not. It's actually very difficult to look inside algorithms and see how they're making these inferences. So who's responsible for those inferences? I don't, I don't know the answer to that. Uh, and finally, uh, finally decision-making. Okay, so decision-making is actually really hard. It's hard for humans. It's hard for computers. And uh, at the moment, I guess, da big data is used to decide what to, uh, to show you in terms of what products you might like to buy or, or not buy. But at some point, we're going to start to get uh, systems, computers, making some more complex decisions for us. Uh, and eventually, we're going to start to embody these systems, uh, in, uh, uh, th these artificial intelligence systems, in, in, in machines, in robots. And uh, so maybe we'll want to, to try and get our robot to help us understand how to end poverty or to, to end cancer. Does anybody know a simple answer to ending poverty and ending cancer? End humans. <laughs> uh, so we have to be very careful about how much power we give, uh, we give to these things, because, of course, the machine can't contextualize things in the, in the way that we do. They can't, they can't under understand us, uh, the, the question, we want you to end cancer or end poverty with all of these other constraints. Don't, don't destroy the world and, and, and don't kill people. We automatically assume those things because of lots of, uh, well, lots of evolution and, 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 of course, all of this prior knowledge that we have. So, so big data, I think, is the catalyst for artificial intelligence. And I think that... What was once science fiction over the next decade is going to start to become uh, science fact. Uh, rather than us intelligently interacting with the world, what will happen is the world is going to start uh, intelligently interacting with us. And, uh, and it's going to change everything. It really is. I can't imagine some of the innovations and amazing things that are going to happen in our generation's lifetime. Um, it's going to be insanely powerful, and I do think that big, uh, the big data and, uh, and artificial intelligence is one of the powerful things that is going to happen since the internet. But my uncle once told me, a very wise man, he said, Daniel, with great power comes great responsibility. <laughs> Thank you for listening. <laughs>